We are 51 out of 52 weeks into the Emmy eligibility period, so the Race for Best Limited series is finally starting. In the next few days, we will see the final episodes of Fosse Verdon and Chernobyl, and the entirety of When They See Us and The Hot Zone will drop, and we've also got Deadwood coming out, and Catch-22 just released all of its episodes. So, Luca, how concerned are you about Emmy voters just not finding the time for all of these late-breaking contenders? Well, considering I, you know, it was difficult for me to find the time to watch all of these contenders, I think it might be quite difficult for Emmy voters to actually see them. But I think another problem is going to be for the shows that premiered, you know, early last year or, you know, in the summer last year or late last year because May and April have had so many new shows premiering that it'll be very difficult for those old shows such as you know, Sharp Objects and Escape at Denimora to still stay in the conversations with all these other shows currently in the zeitgeist. Yeah, I think they're having trouble kind of finding that sweet spot, uh, the networks. Yeah. Like in the last few years, we've seen a lot of dramas and comedies push like right through June uh, and even have some episodes ineligible like The Handmaid's Sale last year. Whereas yes. this year, we pretty much only have, I think, one episode of either drama or comedy that's still to air, which is the Killing Eve finale, yeah. and everything else is done. Um, but it, it seems very risky to me to have a limited series come out with hanging episodes or so yeah. close to the end when you're requiring like viewers to, like, first of all, find out that it even exists. Uh, Zach, w what do you think about all this timing? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um certainly uh, it's it's going to be difficult for a lot of the earlier contenders to uh, hang on uh, simply because of the sheer amount of things that are coming out right now. Um, but on the other hand, it might work in their advantage in a weird way because uh, with so much new stuff coming out, um, it, it might be harder for voters to actually get a chance to watch all of it. And so that might work to the advantage of some of the things that maybe they've already seen all of uh, Escape at Nanamora or A Very English Scandal or Sharp Objects. Maybe that helps them. So uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, honestly, what's going to be um, what's going to be helped and hurt during this uh, Emmy season. Because honestly, like uh, nothing has really hit the zeitgeist in, in a profound way. And to add to what you said, you know, shows that premiered last year, like Sharp Objects or Escape of Denimora, have also had the time to build up momentum with the Golden Globes, with the SAG Awards, and with the Guilds, whereas all these shows in May now really have to rely on their buzz at the moment to uh, break into the limited series category. So I do think that may be a problem uh, for the new shows. And as you said, it's just too many shows at the moment, and who knows how many of those shows Emmy voters will actually sit down to watch. So in the end, it could be a campaign that even tips a show over the edge and gets it into those um, very important categories. I think we actually have a lot of quality contenders this year, too. I, I think yeah. I can count 12, maybe, that I would not be surprised to see get a nomination for Best Limited Series. I and do. I imagine that when we actually watch the nominations announcement, it's going to take a minute to figure out what's actually missing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. true. Absolutely. So the front runner in Golder's odds is Escape at Danamora. We're also predicting Fosse Verdon and Sharp Objects, A Very English Scandal, and True Detective. Uh, Luca, how do you feel, or Zach, how do you feel about that lineup? Uh, I think it's missing something that I, I believe could actually win, which is When They See Us, uh, which hasn't premiered yet. Uh, it's gonna be dropping on the very last day of Emmy eligibility, which is May 31st. Um, but from all the reactions that I've heard from people that have seen it, uh, coupled with the fact that um, it's got a subject matter that is very important and very timely, um, has a huge cast. It's from a, a director who um, is a previous Emmy winner and uh, somebody who is you know, very well respected within the industry. And it's gonna be on a platform that has a lot of money to spend yeah. on Emmy campaigning. Uh, I think that that could be the one that, uh, if it captures the zeitgeist in a big way, if it becomes that thing that everybody's talking about, which it could because, again, it's on Netflix and everybody's at least got a Netflix password, um, 
I could see that coming up from behind and uh, jumping ahead in our odds to first place. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I've actually seen the entire miniseries, and I think uh, I moved it up to my number one spot after I finished it, or even before I finished it, because it seems like a show that can hit the zeitgeist. The only thing that worries me is the May 31st premiere date because it may be too late and it may not peak early enough, which could hurt it in the nomination phase, but really benefit it when they start marking off their ballots for the wins, for the win. So I'm a bit worried about it, but I do think it'll resonate with a lot of people. It's a very relevant story. It's only four episodes, even if the episodes are a bit longer. So it's uh, you know a shorter watch than some of these other limited series. And then another one we should be looking out for is Chernobyl, which is still airing, has a few weeks left to air, which again is a very devastating story that a lot of people will be familiar with. You know, a lot of Emmy voters will have followed the story back then when it eventually came out. So I think that's a real threat to win as well. And I think it proves that Escape at Denimora has been more of like a placeholder, which we said in our last video about two months ago. Yeah, and the thing about Chernobyl, uh, much like uh, when they see us, is that you know it 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 has a timely message, you know, because it's all about uh, a uh, a nuclear power plant disaster and uh, a cover up by government officials. Uh, and I mean, you know, with everything going on in the world right now uh, in terms of climate change, um, I think that that could resonate. Uh, with a lot of voters, it'll be interesting to see what uh, HBO puts their, you know, might yeah. behind uh, because they have sharp objects, which premiered in the summertime and has kind of faded. Um, and they also have True Detective, which uh, came out uh, during Oscar season and uh, did okay in terms mm -hmm. of reviews, but I don't yeah. know if it has the. Um, Passion. I don't think it's going to have the passionate support to get into the top five. So I'll be interested to see what they put all of their money behind. I could see them not even having to choose because at this point I've moved sharp objects down to my fifth slot and wow. I could see it yeah. just yeah. You know, I, falling yeah. out. I, I think the win will be between Chernobyl and when they see us. Yeah. I think when they see us, um, it, it is a lot more important. Uh, and I'm also struck by how cold Chernobyl is. It's not really character driven. Um, yeah, just very detached. But I feel like people really respect it. Yes. Uh, I wonder if it can, you know, appeal to certain older demographics that just kind of uh, like, you know, good old fashioned, uh, sophisticated HBO uh, prestige projects like Band of Brothers or The Pacific. Um, I, I also don't really understand how on IMDb it has become the highest rated mm -hmm. television True. program ever. Really? It, yes. it, uh, it has a 9.6 rating and just over the last couple weeks it's just been going up and up. Uh, helped a little bit by things like Game of Thrones falling. Um, but still, you know, it, it, even if you say like this only has or it doesn't have as many votes as some shows that have been around for years. Like, it's still got all these people to give it 10 out of 10 ratings. And I don't feel like there's any conspiracy here either. Like, I don't feel like there's some, you know, Twitter mob saying, like, everybody yeah. needs to go to IMDb and vote up Chernobyl. I, I, I don't know what the motivation is. So I feel like this is a show that, uh, just based on that, is really connecting with audiences, also based on how its ratings are improving every week. Yes. So. Yes. I, yeah, I'm wondering if uh, when they see us will be too powerful or if they'll appreciate maybe the filmmaking of Chernobyl a bit more. Yeah. Well, I think that um, another thing that might help when they see us is that, um, you know, uh, Donald Trump is obviously a big part of yeah. this story. Um, and it, it might work in its benefit uh, if, it's, if it's seen as like an anti-Trump vote. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, you can just sort of imagine the power of, um, uh, I mean, obviously there's a lot more to this show than just, you know, a middle finger to Donald Trump. There's the whole issue of the criminal justice system and, and how it uh, unfairly targets people of color and, and uh, demonizes black and brown men. Uh, and, um, you know, so there's a lot going on there, but I feel like that component of it, uh, if people feel like their vote matters, and their vote counts for something, I think that that could benefit something like when they see us. 
Yes. And um, another show that I actually put into the lineup, which is a risky choice, is The Act, because I think it's a show that was seen. I think it hit a record for Hulu. I think it had attracted the most subscribers in the first 24 hours for a certain show. I don't remember what the exact record was. And I think visibility is very important in this category. And I think it'll be the, it's, the it's time for Hulu to break into this race with a limited series. And I don't think Catch-22 is going to do that. So I'm curious to uh, hear what you guys think about Catch-22 and the act. Yeah, what, what about why not Catch-22? Because that does seem like the more obvious push from Hulu with all those big names yeah. attached, the more accessible-ish subject matter. Yeah. It reminds me of the, I don't know if it matters, but it reminds me of the Looming Tower last year where I think it'll get the big names in like Kyle Chandler and George Clooney and maybe a directing nomination, but it lacks the passion to break into other categories, which I think the act on the other hand actually has. I think it has passion because it's this real life story that a lot of people, you know, have been talking about in the last few years since it didn't, since it happened not that long ago. And they also had the whole documentary about it. And I think it was more in the zeitgeist than Catch-22 is at the moment, which again, may be caused by the fact um, that there are so many limited series airing right now. Yeah, I feel like zero people are talking about Catch-22. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we're talking about it right now, so that's, <laughs> <we> that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but um, aside from us, yeah, I mean, that's, um, I, I don't know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think the act sort of surprised a lot of people. And um, I know that there's a lot of support for the uh, performances in it. Uh, there's a lot of passion for both Joey King and Patricia Arquette. So mm -hmm. that might be the thing that helps push it over the top. Uh, I think the Catch-22, because of its all-star cast and because of its lofty uh, literary uh, uh, inspiration, it, uh, it has a, a sort of prestige to it that makes it feel important, but I don't know if that really translates into passionate number one votes. Yes. I thought it was very telling on Metacritic, you know, out of the 30 reviews that they gathered, uh, Cash 22 has like a weighted average score of 71, but not a single one of those reviews was 100. So it mm. seems like there's, yeah. yeah, respect for it, but maybe nobody actually loves it. Yeah. And I do feel bad for Sharp Objects because last year when it premiered, I was pretty sure it was gonna actually win limited series, which of course was a bit too early to say anything. But I think if HBO had kept it for last year's Emmys or you know had it, uh, it had aired it earlier, I think it would have performed better overall. And I do agree that it's more like in fourth or fifth uh, place at the moment, which is a shame. But again, this race is stacked this year. It's incredibly stacked, more stacked than it's been in the last few years, or last year at least. I think Amy Adams would have been a guaranteed Emmy winner last year. Exactly, that, yeah. You know, all yeah. the respect to Regina King, of course. <laughs> um, but um, oh, yeah. you know, I, I think that, that uh, it might have even challenged uh, Versace for a limited series for all we know. Um, uh -huh. And but, yeah. And another series that I would like to mention, which I don't think is getting in, which is a shame, is The Haunting of Hill House. Another show that really hit the zeitgeist in October when it came out, maybe even in November. But I'm not sure if Netflix is going to mount that big a campaign for it. And I'm worried about the genre, even though we have a show like Game of Thrones winning four drama series prizes. I just worry about the fact that uh, Haunting of Hill House may not be, you know, the voter's cup of tea. But I, I think it really deserves to be nominated and I wish more people were talking about it at the moment. There's another one that's coming out on the last day of uh, Emmy eligibility, which is Good Omens from Amazon. Um, I don't, I haven't heard anything really. I mean, I've done interviews for it, so I've, I've seen oh. it. Um, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about it yet. Um, well, so the I'll reviews just... are starting to come out. Okay. I think it's pretty soft on, in terms of those. Okay, yes. yeah. I can never keep review embargoes straight in my mind, so I... Yeah, but yeah that's, that's true. I totally forgot about that one. That's another entire limited series just dropping at the very end here. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the reviews have been pretty poor from what I've seen. Is there any chance that something like um, Fosse Verdon can win? I mean, I think that... I know people are talking about it, but I don't know if the subject matter is quite as... Um, 
uh, universal in a way, you know what I mean? I, I think that it serves a niche audience definitely. Exactly. Um, but I don't know. Do you think that there's any way that it might be classy enough to win? I, I think it might be classy enough to get nominated. Uh, <laughs> because right now I don't have it getting nominated just because I, yeah, this is such a stacked field that kind of, if I have any kind of nagging feeling or if I have a kind of gut reaction to something like the act or the haunting of Hill house where the genre just seems kind of off or in terms of Fosse Verdon, it's just, there doesn't seem to be passion for it. I, I see it as kind of like cash 22. I think it'll get, uh, the two lead actors in possibly a directing nomination off of the, uh, name recognition for Hamilton, but. Uh, I, I feel like the subject matter is just not going to be connecting with uh, a broader audience. And we saw last year with The Alienist that that is actually really important and much more mm -hmm. important than people being passionate about a contender uh, like Twin Peaks. And then how about yeah. A Very English Scandal? Is that too English for, <laughs> for voters? Uh, I can't like get a read on that one. I can see you get in for like both actors and Stephen Frears and writing. But um, I think that series is sort of up in the air. But well, that's like everything. So how would it miss? But yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, yeah. <laughs> but it also aired such a long time ago again, and it's just three episodes. I wonder, I mean, when they see us as only four episodes, but I wonder if the three episodes will actually hurt the show's chances. And I just feel like it's fallen out of the conversation. It came and went, obviously. It performed well at the Globes and at Critics' Choice, I believe, and got the one SAG nomination but I don't know if people will actually remember that it's uh, eligible in this cycle. Of course, they'll see it on the ballot, but I don't know if it has the visibility that it needs to get into this incredibly stacked race. And for Fosse Verdon, it has the prestige factor working in its favor, but it didn't get the critical acclaim that I think most people were uh, anticipating. And n people are talking about it, but I feel like the buzz is a bit muted. I think people are talking about Michelle Williams, but I don't know if people are talking about the show overall or any of its uh, cast members at the moment, except for Williams. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really excited to see the hot zone either mm -hmm. shoot up or not shoot up in our odds. Right now it's at 100 to one. I, I think like only six people are predicting it or something like that. Uh, I'm one of them. I think that we saw last year that National Geographic really knows how to campaign. They had a show that got a 0.0, .0 rating in the Nielsen's, had like a 50 or something on Metacritic. So nobody saw it, nobody liked it, and yet somehow Genius was still uh, a Best Limited Series nominee over the likes of Twin Peaks. That's so this true. year they've got something that's much more accessible, it's more uh, high octane, thrilling, it's got a uh, familiar face with Julianne Juliana Margulies uh, at the head of it. And I'm also impressed by the campaign that National Geographic is running, specifically how they're screening the hot zone in 12 cities. Whereas if you go to the Emmy website and look at all the FYC events that have happened this season, mm -hmm. you will find only one uh, that was outside LA or New York. Uh, Ozark ran, or they had a, a screening in Atlanta at one point. Whereas uh, the hot zone is appealing to all of these neglected voters who live, you know, at in other parts of the country. Yeah, it, it'll ahead. be interesting to see. I mean, I think that um, it does. Uh, you're right. I mean, National Geographic has proven they can campaign really well, mm -hmm. and it also does serve a certain uh, kind of uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? A certain kind of taste that audiences have, you know, for mm -hmm. kind of high-end uh, melodramatic entertainments that are, you know, based in true stories and so have a little bit of, sh a bit of uh, importance to it and recognizable TV stars. So, I mean, I could say that one uh, doing fairly well in nominations. Yeah. And I think we saw last year how important a good campaign is. I think both the alienist and genius uh, Picasso really benefited from that. And Nat Geo didn't only get in last year, it also got in the year before. So mm -hmm. it seems like it seems like a safe bet to actually predict the hot zone. But again, as we've said multiple times, we're honestly not sure about any of these contenders. I mean, it's so, so stacked. It's very difficult to just um, single out five to put into this lineup. It, 
it's funny how we're talking about National Geographic being able to campaign. Amazon is the richest company on earth. You think they could <laughs> put some true. money into? <laughs> they could put some money into something other than Mrs. Maisel. You know, I mean, there's that's true. They paid zero dollars in taxes last year. Come on, you spent <laughs> that money for <laughs> to get a very English scandal nominated. And one last show I, that I would like to mention is Maniac. Again, a show that premiered in September, a show that people weren't too you know, excited about when it came out, a show that the critics liked but didn't love, and a show that did not perform well at the Globes or at the SAG Awards, it only got in Emma Stone. It did do well at the Guilds, if I recall correctly, but I- Yeah, again, like they, they clearly all saw it, so that, yeah. that is something. Yeah, I think you so just I, made the case though for why it won't get nominated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in your mentioning of it. <laughs> yeah, so that's just another contender. I'm curious to see if Netflix throws their money behind that. Well, I think Emma Stone or, would be. Um, yeah, you know, or okay. Sally Field. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, that's the last contender that I could think of. All right, uh, let's move on to movie. So this year, right. HBO, they've got six contenders, which is more than usual, also more than the number of slots. Uh, most of them are kind of you know middling reviews. Amazon, they've got King Lear, but they're actually pushing the Romanoffs harder. They've sent that one out oh. as uh, its own DVD set, um, you know, very fancy packaging. And they're submitting two episodes, so I feel like that'll confuse people. And we also have the reigning champ the last two years, Black mirror so do we think that black mirror is going to win again or are you guys jumping on the bandwagon that deadwood is really taking off right now well i've seen the deadwood movie so i i think that it is actually uh in a position to win um not just because of um you know collective goodwill from the television show uh but it's actually a pretty good movie you know, uh, it does a really nice job of, of wrapping things up from the series. Um, and I think that people get a kick out of watching all of these uh, stars return to uh, these roles that they love so much. So I, I think that that could actually um, overtake uh, Bandersnatch also because I think that it has a shot at getting into other categories like acting, like writing, like possibly directing. Um, I mean, it could win for writing, uh, yeah. honestly. Yeah. So I think that that's going to help it uh, over a Black Mirror installment that, you know, not a lot of people were really talking about. I mean, you can't compare it to uh, the last two that won because, uh, I mean, those were uh, highly praised and highly viewed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Bandersnatch didn't land well with uh, audiences, which is why I did move... Uh, Deadwood up to my number one slot, especially after the reactions after uh, its first screening. I think it's a show that will resonate with a lot of Emmy voters, especially those that watched uh, the original series back when it came out. Um, I do fear, though, that I think Black Mirror is dropping its fifth season in early June. So I don't know if that in some way would uh, help Bandersnatch, but I don't think a lot of people actually liked Bandersnatch, which will really hurt it in, in, the, in this case. There's another reason why I think Deadwood could, you know, be vulnerable, but I'll let Briley say that because I think he'll say that. Oh, okay, well, sure, I, I better say it then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, yeah, I, I saw Deadwood and um, like I did not watch the original series. I had seen the pilot and I wonder how many voters in the Academy are like me or like us, you know, they've admitted so many millennials in the last few years, thousands actually, uh, who, and, and I wouldn't say that Deadwood has been top priority viewing over the last few years uh, in the way that maybe The Wire or The Sopranos were for anybody who's kind of catching up on the new golden age of television drama. Um, yeah. Well, I, I know that there yeah. is, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, especially with the movie coming out, there was a lot of people who wanted to check it out for the first time. Um, I mean, it does have a following. There's people who uh, really do love the show. And um, I mean, I think that uh, this could maybe help people want to, you know, go back and watch the film. But you do bring up a good point. 
Uh, the other thing that could hurt it is uh, the name recognition of Black Mirror, since it's just one twice in a row. Uh, it could just be like a name check type thing. Um, I don't think it's a slam dunk by any means, but I yeah. think that uh, given the weakness of the category overall, um, it uh, it's at an advantage in that way, at least if it can like, you know, get, it's getting like good reviews. Yeah, um, good. Whereas all these other things, I mean, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, you want to talk about people not actually watching anything? I mean, right. let's, let's talk about these TV movies that I can't even remember the names of. Yeah, I'm very curious to see if the producers of To All the Boys I've Loved Before uh, oh submit the movie like they did at the Guild Awards, and they invariably got nominations because I mean that had visibility, and we saw it with Grace and Monaco that that's all you need. Mm -hmm. Oh god. Yeah, I'm curious to see. I'm also curious to see if Native Son gets in or if my dinner with Hervé gets in because that has Peter Dinklage and anything with Peter Dinklage should actually be in our predictions. But I, I'm, as Zach said, I'm just not sure because all, all these movies don't seem, except for Deadwood and perhaps Bandersnatch, don't seem to have a lot of passion or anyone talking about it. I mean, we have Brexit and King Lear. So uh, this category is always a bit confusing. They might just vote for Brexit out of uh, I mean, name will. recognition for the uh, for it's the flashy event title. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, just yeah. like last year with Flint, you know, yeah. that random like exactly. movie. Yeah, I think at this point, Brex both Brexit and King Lear, for example, are pretty much locks. And I think the fifth spot is up for grabs. I'm not sure. There's also the I think OG, the movie with Jeffrey Wright on HBO. Uh, as Riley said, we have a lot of HBO contenders in this category, but I don't think that one will break in. What I find is uh, anecdotally, when I talk to people about Bandersnatch, you know, I say like, oh, did you like that? And they say, eh, not really. There have been better Black Mirror episodes, but I appreciate, you know, what they were going for, what they were trying, trying to you know, push the boundaries there. So I wonder yeah. if it still has enough of like that kind of respect. Yeah. I mean, it could, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's just, uh, Again, it's such a uh, kind of nothing category that um, you know it could win off of that name recognition alone, in the same way the Deadwood could. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I think that it really is only those two. Probably, uh, I'm just interested to see if any of these movies can uh, manage to receive nominations outside That's of just nice. the you know uh, the movie category. Like if they can do, if they can get into acting and writing and directing and tech nominations. Yes. I would say Black Mirror is not getting into writing this year, even though it's no, won the last two. Yeah. Well, that'll be a major deal. I mean. <laughs> it's um, true. Yeah. All right. So there you have it. There are the races for Outstanding Limited Series and Outstanding Movie. Uh, right now, the Gold Derby Prediction Center only has 11 contenders for movie. So if that is actually how many we have on the ballot, and that happens again next year, that means that the Academy will be forced to discontinue the category. So hopefully that happens. Uh, but I'm sure we'll actually get a whole bunch of random Lifetime and Nickelodeon movies on the ballot. 